for today comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 25. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, Love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we're in week two of our Kingdom Culture Sermon Series. There's a really sharp screw on this. I'm gonna put this right here, Rich, be careful. It's there. And we're going through the book of uh, First Peter, right? And we're looking at how we as Christians live in the culture we're in, in the time we're in, without being consumed by that same culture. And this is a, a hard concept. It's a hard line because we're trying to figure out, right, how can I live as much like the world as possible to not be weird, but enough like God to still be counted as holy? And we're trying to figure out where that ever-changing line is in our lives. And Peter writes this book to the, the the Christians in Asia Minor in a similar concept of, hey, you're living in this culture, it's not the same, it's not what you, what you hoped it would be, how do you live in that? And that's what we're looking at today. So we get to the first word, verse 13, therefore. And when you get to therefore, you have to ask, what's it there for? Why is it there? And we talked about last week how Peter, in the beginning of 1 Peter, talked about why we live in a kingdom culture. It's because of King Jesus. None of it matters if it's not for Jesus. If we don't accept that Jesus is king, nothing else matters. Nothing else compares. There's no reason for us to live differently. If Jesus is not king, that would be foolish. Why be weird when weird is not beneficial to you or to the world? Why allow ourselves all this extra work if Jesus is not king? So because of the truth of the salvation we have in Jesus, because of all the mighty acts of salvation, of God through scripture and paramount in Christ. Therefore, therefore, because you know this is true, therefore, and it says this, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope in the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed as is coming. Now, the NIV here, I feel loses some of the flavor of the text when we look at this because what is translated here as with minds that are alert, often is translated as gird up your loins. Now, we don't have loins except for pork loin, right? That's kind of our, our loins we think of right now. But loins at the time of Jesus would have been just these long robes that people wore. And to gird up your loins means that you would take your robes and gather them up and tie them in a way that you could run, that you could do the work you've been called to do, that you could, could be fully available for what was ever needed. 
That wasn't all the time. But when you girded up your loins, people know it's, it's about to go down. It's time to get down to business. It's, it's go time. If you saw a guy girding up his loins, you're like, why is he about to run? Should I also be about to run? What is about to happen? So what this should read is, therefore, prepared for action. Therefore, prepared to go and do the work. Therefore, prepared to go where God has called you to be. And fully sober. Now, this has a lot less to do about intoxication than we think it does. You see, the sober does not just mean that we're you know, not supposed to be inebriated. It means that we're not supposed to also be distracted or lazy. Because I think a lot of Christians are not effective the way they should be, not because they're drunk, but because they're lazy, but because we're distracted, because we have 24-hour news cycles and tons of awesome things to watch on Hulu or Netflix, or because we have so many other things that we could be focusing on, and that keeps us from doing what we're doing. So, therefore, prepared for action and with a mind focused, Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Christ Jesus is revealed at his coming. This is hope. And so often we think about hope as being a wishing. Man, I really hope that it doesn't rain so I can play golf. Man, I really hope that when we get home, my wife has not eaten the last of the Reese's Puffs. Because that is my favorite nighttime snack. But that's not what we're talking about here. You see, there's two other words for that type of hope in the Greek. Peter uses both of those words elsewhere in his writings. He does not use either of those here. This is hope. This is assured belief. Money in the bank. It is going to happen. It is coming. I can bank my life on it, and so many of them did. Because they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christ was returning. And somehow, some way, beyond all the grace that we received by Christ's death for us, there's still more grace. There's still more grace for us to receive. That's the hope that Peter is talking about. There's even more hope. So we have our hope set. We have our, our loins girded, right? We're, we're sober-ish. We're ready to go. And it says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Before, we didn't know better. We were ignorant. We didn't really know the rules or who God was or what our sin was, right? And Peter says, Hey, before, you didn't know, and that's okay. My daughter, Elena, when we lived in Miami, she started walking, and I was so proud. My daughter's walking. And she walked up to the TV, and she slapped it. And I was less proud. <laughs> I, was, I was quite angered at that. I was like, why are you, don't you know how expensive this TV is? Well, she didn't. She had no idea what a TV was. How can I be angry at a child that has no idea what they're doing? She just thought, if I hit the Paw Patrol, the Paw Patrol will move. That's how God looks at us. We're ignorant children, just walking around smacking things for no reason. And he's like, oh, I love you. Please stop being stupid, <laughs> but I love you. <laughs> but please figure it out, but I love you. And then we learn. We learn the truth of our salvation. We learn the truth about God. And he says, now, now that you know the truth, be obedient. Now that you know the truth, the hope, the grace, be obedient to what God has called you to be. Because now that you know the rules, you're held accountable to them. That's what Peter's telling us. And then he says this word, be holy. Be holy. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy. God is holy, but what what does holiness mean? How do we live a holy life? A holy life. What does it mean for us to to have holiness? And we can conceptualize this a little bit, right? Like we have things in our lives that we know have been holy, holy places, 
There are spaces that you've gone to, and you know this is a holy space. Holy moments that God has spoken in a new way. Holy conversations. In hindsight, you say, wow, God was there. But when it comes to us being holy, that's a really hard concept. Because we know us. We know the dirty. We know the unclean. We know all the things about us that we really hope God just didn't look at that time. And so it's hard for us to understand what holiness is for us because we don't get it. Holiness means to be set apart, but not just set apart, set apart with a purpose, with God's purpose. It's not a set of rules. It's not being a certain type of person. It's less about behavior and more about intent. Holiness is a life focused on glorifying God and being set apart for that mission. Holy things are set apart, set apart for the kingdom of God. That's why things are holy. So as we come to this time of prayer, I want to ask you a question. What have you been set apart for? What in your life has been set apart for God's kingdom? What in your life is holy? Where have you seen holy spaces, holy moments, holy conversations? Hopefully not a holy roller, but where in your life have you been set apart for God's holiness? So everybody understand holy yet? No, that's okay. It's a confusing topic. You know, it's one of those things where it's so not us that's hard to get. Analogies seem to fall short in most ways. It's, it's of God, and because of that, it's so much different, and we have a hard time really understanding it. Like I said, we have the holy spaces, moments, conversations. We know when it's around us, but when we apply it to us, it's different. How can we be like God? Well, we can't. We, just, we can't. We have no power in that whatsoever. But luckily, God sent the Holy Spirit. God sent us this, this helper who would help us attain sanctification, help us become holy like God through the power of the Holy Spirit and through Scripture. The closer we get to God, the closer we come to being with the Father, the more holy we can be in reflecting God's holiness there. But holiness wasn't just a hard concept for us in 2021. It was a hard concept at the time of Jesus, too. The Pharisees were people that were considered to be the experts on holiness. You see, they, they decided that God had given them this, this special status of holy. They had all these rules they followed. They took special baths. That, that's real life. Took special baths, and they made them holy. And because of that, they thought that they had arrived. And if they got holiness right, then why did Jesus call them a brood of vipers? We see the, the Pharisees took holiness a different direction. Follow me in this analogy. The, the Pharisees took holiness as a white shirt. You might notice, if you've been here for a while, I don't wear white shirts. This is probably the lightest shirt that I own. And there's probably a stain I didn't see when I put it on today because I'm a bad eater. I, I got stuff falling down left and right. I have children, amen, right? Light-colored clothing, not for me. I'm more of a black and gray kind of guy. It's a little easier that way. But the Pharisees took holiness as this beautiful white shirt that God had given them, and they put that on. And then they thought they were supposed to keep that shirt as beautiful and as white as possible. And I imagine, you know, the time of Jesus, 30 AD, was probably as messy as my house was at spaghetti night, right? So they made sure to keep themselves away from anything that can make them dirty. Sinners, no, 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 no. Can't have them rubbing off on the shirt. Can't have any stains, so the sinners got to stay away. Oh, the, the people who are sick, you know, what if they cough? Sick people are icky. We don't, we don't want them to touch the shirt. We got to keep them away. Children, in all the advances of technology we have in the past 2,000 years, children are still as messy today as they were in 30 AD. 
There's no, not been any technological advances there at all. So children could not be around the Pharisees. Pharisees pushed anyone away who was seeking holiness in order to protect their own holiness. They wanted to make sure it didn't have any blemishes. And the white shirt had to stay as clean as possible. And then Jesus came. And like Jesus does, he flipped everything upside down. You see, Jesus said, no, 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 holiness is not a white shirt. It's bleach. You see, a white shirt, we're terrified of something getting on it, right? We don't want to get it dirty because then we have to go and clean it. It's going to be awful. And if you get a stain in it too bad, it's never going to get cleaned again, right? White shirt, terrified of everything. Bleach, different type of terrified. Because no matter what you intend it for it to do, if bleach gets on anything, it's going to do what bleach does. It's going to clean. It's going to make things white. Jesus treated holiness as bleach. He was filled with it. And he walked into certain situations and places and things. And he ate with people who were sinners. And he, he healed people. And he casted out demons. And all the way, he was spreading bleach, holiness, like a sprinkler. Every single person who ever came in contact with Jesus was changed. Every single one. Maybe it was a spot of bleach on their shirt. Maybe they got doused by it. But no matter what, Jesus spread holiness so much that it encompassed everything around him. He went and ate with sinners, not so they could rub off on him, but so that he could rub off on them. So that the holiness that he had from God the Father would change them. Jesus hung out with sinners, but he never sinned. Jesus ate with tax collectors, but he didn't say what they did was good. He allowed his life to be a system of spreading holiness to the world. And that's how you and I are called to be. With Jesus, chains were broken, demons were cast out, freedom from sin happened because he showed us what holiness is supposed to be like. God is holy. And we know that. We experience God holiness before we even know probably who God is. We get into these situations, these moments. Maybe you walk into the church for the first time and you're like, this is different. Or a church mother or church father took you under the wing and you said, why are they being this way? And it's because of the holiness of God. You've brushed against it. It got a little bit on you. And then you want it more. And that's the holiness that God expects for us. When we accept the gospel, we are baptized in the spirit. We are baptized in water like we're going to do on August 8th at the lake baptism. But you are also given a bucket of bleach. You're given holiness by God. And it's not a status for you to achieve. It's a call for you to go out and answer of spreading that into the world, of spreading bleach everywhere so that no one that comes in contact with you can avoid it. And bleach does what bleach does. Holiness does what holiness does. It casts out things that are not of this world or cast out things that are of this world so that we can be more like our God who is not of this world. That's what holiness does. There's a theologian named Wayne Gruden. He says this about this passage. If we first know the great truths about our salvation and then begin a habit of visualizing ourselves personally on a path of life leading without fail to unimaginable heavenly reward, we will be mentally and emotionally ready to strive for a life of holiness before God. If we know the truth and see ourselves being who God has called us to be, we will prepare ourselves physically, emotionally, and spiritually to strive for holiness because it's not easy. But it's what we're called to do. It says in the next verse, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, the Lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times to, for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Once again, Peter reminds us of why. Why do you live differently? Jesus. If Jesus is not king, then all this is silly. If Jesus is not who he says he is, then holiness is not something to be achieved. 
But because of Jesus, because of what happened for him, we are called to live our lives differently. Not like we used to. Lives that were going nowhere, that were spinning the wheels but not really getting any traction because we didn't know what we were living for. Not like that, but a life fully seeking holiness after the example of Jesus. And then it says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. If you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. So how? How do we do this? It says, we purify ourselves by obeying the truth. The truth of God found in Scripture, read in context through study by the Holy Spirit. And that truth leads to love. If your study of, the, of Scriptures, if your meditations do not leave you, lead you to a place of love, then you're bringing in too much baggage to your study of Scripture. If you cannot read God's Word and the Holy Spirit not show you that the answer is always love, then you're the one that needs to change, not God. Holiness needs to come into your life more. You need to be changed because the answer always will be love. It's not Christianity 101. It's doctorate level Christianity. The answer is always love. That's how we are meant to live. So, I have to ask you the question then. How do you live in a kingdom culture? What does it look like for us to live differently than the world? How do we live in such a way that the world sees God through us? Be holy. Be holy. Spread it out. Seek after God through his truth. Open your heart to what the Holy Spirit's saying, and be holy, for our God is holy. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray that you would allow us a glimpse of your kingdom so that we can see the good news, so we know our faith is not in vain, so we know what we are striving for as we gird up our loins and run the, way, run the race, God. Let holiness be our goal because it's what you've called us to. Let being like Jesus be our goal because we can never go wrong. Holy Spirit, change us to be more like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.